Um, so this is based on joint work with uh, David Rabouin, who's here. But um, we couldn't present together because we would have started arguing uh, in the middle of the talk and <laughs> forgot about the audience, so that wouldn't be a bad, um, bad outcome. Um, okay, so here's, uh, here's the outline. I'm going to start <coughs> explaining some general distinctions that are widespread in the literature um, about uh, something like a graphic linguistic distinction. Then we'll expose a problem uh, with maybe one of the most widespread criteria that's used to uh, conceptualize this distinction. Uh, we'll diagnose what the problem, what the criterion is that leads to this problem, and then we'll expose two more um, refined proposals to distinguish different classes of representations. Um, okay, so uh, first I'm going to start with the distinctions. For a moment, I thought you were going to expose the eyes It's an illusion. It's a multimodal talk. <laughs> multimodal. So, um, there's a very general, uh, there's a uh, frequent idea that there's an important distinction um, between two kinds of representations. Uh, so, I'm going to show you a quote by uh, John Kubicki, who's a prominent philosopher of images and graphical representations more generally in the analytic tradition. Um, who says, they are fairly arbitrary pairings of names with things, exemplified in language, and they are representations that present likenesses, exemplified by figurative photographs. One goal of this book is to convince the reader that this broad distinction between the images and mostly arbitrary pairings is important and worthy of attention despite all the complications. So, the idea he has is that you have a distinction between, let's say, symbolic or linguistic representations on the one hand, and uh, graphic or iconic, sometimes called diagrammatic. So you're going to do a broad survey. Many authors, they all have different distinctions, different terminologies. So I apologize for the fact that the terminology is going to be fluctuating. So the risk of the exercise. and. Um, this, uh, the basis of this is that supposedly the symbolic representations are based on some arbitrary pairings and the graphic or linguistic, uh, the graphic or iconic representations are based on something like resemblance. Um, however, this may be understood. And then there's a frequent an argument that's frequently made that an important use of graphic or iconic representations is that insofar as they look like what they represent, um, they are useful because we can learn new things by inspecting the representation. So uh, I just said that for Kuvik, he has a very broad notion of resemblance. Um, it's very problematic, of course, but we won't go into this right now. Uh, and he said things like, so images, structure-preserving representations more generally, allow users to work with the representations in order to think about what they represent. So as they look like, what they are about, you can just look at the representation and see things or learn things. Okay. So, uh, argument. Um, one can learn from graphical representations by inspecting them. By inspection. Now, in science or in mathematics, inspection. inspection. Is this illegible? Yeah, I try to uh, write in a non non French way later, not not in a not attached way. I forgot to switch to a more legible way of writing. Um, okay, so now a distinction of this broad kind is often made in mathematics, but it's not usually based on this distinction between arbitrariness and resemblance. Actually, there's a tradition in mathematics uh, which is due to the history of the field, maybe. Uh, in the 19th and early 20th century, whereby, well, there was this whole foundational program of trying to uh, eliminate the appeals to intuition, or to graphical representations like geometric figures, things like that, um, in favor of uh, more uh, verbally conducted proof based on clear axioms and possibly algebraic manipulations as well. And so, Kind of in the um, the way this program developed uh, was created a distinction between, on the one hand, well, natural language, of course, and then when formal languages were introduced to uh, 
study linguistic reasoning more precisely, uh, they were also naturally put on the side of rigor, etc., and also algebraic equations were naturally on this side. And expressions, more generally symbolic expressions. Again, on the other side, you would have diagrams, uh, possibly geometric, like in Euclid, but also more abstract diagrams, potentially. Like diagrams of functions, or even other diagrams, or Venn diagrams, or things like that. Okay, so this distinction for the reasons I just exposed was very salient, and even though in recent years there has been a lot of interest in the study of diagrammatic reasoning, and people try to say, oh, maybe we can reason um, rigorously using diagrams, still, it didn't really eliminate the distinctions. Actually, the distinction, actually people like Bauer and Etchemendi, who are the pioneers in the formalization of this, um, they thought, okay, so maybe diagrams and sentences are somewhat more alike than we thought, since we can use both rigorously, but um, this means we have to look for other ways of understanding the distinction. And they fall back, fell back on something like resemblance, uh, broadly construed, where they have a more precise theory. And some other authors, uh, many actually, fell back on a distinction uh, of the Persian, uh, of a Persian strip. So this distinction is sometimes attributed to Pers, not by Pulvicki, uh, but by some other people. So just to say I'm not inventing this, here are some examples, and here this is uh, from Valeria, because she's here, so... Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> but... It makes even more reason to purchase. So, as we shall understand these categories, Symbolic representation is exemplified by the lexicons of languages like English, Chinese, or predicate logic. So as you say, C uh, logic is included here in the linguistic side. It also includes codes like those governing maritime signal flags, Arabic numerals, so kind of symbolic representations. Uh, according to a rough first approximation, all forms of symbolic representation are based on arbitrary connections between signs and their contents. By contrast, iconic representations include the likes of drawings, photographs, maps, graphs, Venn diagrams, and depictive gestures. Such signs are characterized very roughly by natural and non-arbitrary relations between sign and content, often described as relations of resemblance. Um, okay, and uh, I'm not going to read all of those. Uh, here's another one by Atsushi Shimojima, uh, who's also exposing a distinction roughly on this uh, of this kind, and putting first of all the logic squarely on the linguistic side. Uh, here's another one by Sanju Shin, who worked a lot on Venn diagrams, order diagrams, and things like that, and uh, who puts Boolean algebra and first order logic on the linguistic side. And here's another one, because we're at the IHPST, of Marion Worms, who uh, wrote her PhD here at the Maître de Conférence, and who writes very nicely, uh, Représentation linguistique ou formule, on the one hand, and spatial representations of figures on the other hand, and the formulas, that is the linguistic representations, include expressions in mathematical language, quote, like equations, and also uh, natural language expressions, as well as this uh, reasons I won't enter into here. Okay, so there's this widespread distinctions. Some people are conceptualizing it in that way, and of course, some authors are conceptualizing it in different ways. Okay, now, what's the problem? Well, the thing is, we're supposed to have arbitrariness and resemblance, and because the linguistic representations eventually are, sorry? Sorry. Yeah, I'm to make it Excuse me. Okay, so, and the argument is that you can learn from the graphic presentations because they resemble. So, the problem is that actually the distinction as it's made in mathematics and this conceptualizing, conceptualization are actually quite incompatible. Uh, the reason is simple. The reason is, and that's the problem, is that actually in math we constantly inspect uh, representations that fall on this linguistic side to learn things. Uh, so, actually, you know, this distinction is often attributed to Peirce, 
But actually, he made this observation as well. So he said his uh, terminology was an icon versus symbol. And he says, thus, an algebraic formula is an icon rendered such by the rules of commutation, association, and distribution of the symbols. It may seem at first glance that it is an arbitrary classification to call an algebraic expression an icon, that it might as well, or better, be regarded as a compound conventional sign or a symbol uh, composed of symbols, let's say. But it is not so. For a great distinguishing property of the icon is that by the direct observation of it, other truths concerning its object can be discovered than those which suffice to determine its construction. This capacity of revealing <coughs> unexpected truth is precisely that wherein the utility of algebraical formulae consists, so that the iconic character is the prevailing one. Okay, so um, to make this a little more precise, we can give some examples of this phenomenon whereby we inspect the formulas. Um, so actually it's very usual that uh, when we have a formula, we're not, we're not just using it to assert something, so this complicated relation holds. We look at the formula and say, oh, we have this algebraic equation. Uh, we can see that it is of degree 2, for instance, for a polynomial equation, of degree n, or that there are some terms in it, etc. We examine the structure. Uh, a little, maybe more complicated example, which is basically the same thing, is saying, for instance, uh, this is Descartes, which is introducing the method of undeterminate coefficients. So he derived this complicated equation, and he said it should be the same as an equation which has this form here. Um, and so he will identify corresponding coefficients in both equations to identify them. So for instance, he'll identify this one, which is the coefficient of the term in y, with minus 2ey, which is the uh, term of the same degree. And he will derive a relation from this. So this requires you to inspect the equations and to recognize some structure in it. Okay. Uh, uh, and just to convince you, once more, I just propose we compare uh, something which is clearly diagrammatic with something which is clearly symbolic, at least in the classifications that are usually uh, deployed. Um, well, you can inspect, when you prove a theorem by inspecting the figure like this, you maybe you reason and say, okay, so this angle is the same as this angle, and this angle is the same as this angle, so if I take the sum of this one, this one, and this one, it will be the same as this one, this one, and this one, etc. So I'm inspecting various parts of the figure and saying things, and what I'm claiming is that often we do something not so different when we work with a formula. Uh, well, we have this formula and we say, okay, so what's the limit for x tending towards zero? And I say, okay, so here's the degree is three, I can recognize that, and here I see that actually the degree in x is two, so the term at the top is gonna dominate, and here I have this, um, and so on. And so, uh, I'm not saying that the proofs are the same. Okay, there are, there are important differences, of course, but from the point of view of the fact that we inspect the representations to learn things, uh, there's a clear similarity here. So, what's the problem? So, um, the problem is just that we learn from uh, symbolic or linguistic, let's say, presentations. And so, this idea surely can't be right as it stands. Uh, so, what, what was the problem? So, I know it is unfair, but I have to correct it later. <laughs> mm. um, so the mistake, well, the mistake, actually, it's a ploy that's often used by authors starting from this distinction. They will start very carefully and say, language is based on arbitrary pairings because, for instance, the word tree is an arbitrary sign for uh, a certain tree. Okay, and then they will subtly shift to language being in this category, not just elementary words or components, but the entire expressions. Um, and so, well, it is true that if you look at symbols, for instance, in first order logic, the symbol for negation, or the symbol for, for all, or I don't know, P for a predicate, or X for a variable, things like that, these are arbitrary signs in a certain sense, to a certain extent at least. But uh, if I 
consider a complex expression, like I don't know, for all x, uh, not, p, not p of x or something like that, this is not arbitrary at all. This is a structured expression. It has a lot of structure, uh, interesting structure. So to make the point even clearer, I'm going to say that this is not so different from some graphic representations. So here's uh, a part of a map of France. Uh, so the capital city is represented by a big red dot, and important cities are represented by uh, smaller red dots and small cities by black dots. Okay, now uh, there's no connection, uh, whether it be natural or otherwise, between a big red dot and the city of Paris. This is a completely arbitrary sign. Uh, what makes this map diagrammatic or graphic in any sense are the relations between the various components, <coughs> between the various arbitrary signs that are the elementary components. So it's not, the difference can't be about the arbitrariness or not of components. If you don't like the fact that this is a hybrid representation because they are linguistic names, you can just forget the names. I was tempted to actually delete them from the map, but it would have taken too much time, so I didn't do it. But you can imagine that. You can imagine that without the names, and it's still a map, and the components are still arbitrary, and the map is not arbitrary. Yes. Yes, but it gives you no the same information. No, I agree, but it still gives you some information yeah. uh, about the disposition of cities in yeah, France. Yeah, yeah. True, but in any case, the point remains, I believe. Um, and if you say that uh, with the name removes it, it's not a graphical representation, I think you'll have to concede that there are no pure graphical representations at all anywhere. So, um, well, so this, this idea, at least that there has, there's an important contrast between arbitrary and not arbitrary, or arbitrary and resemblance, can't be right just like this, actually. No representations that are used in math are arbitrary in this sense because they're always structured representations, otherwise, they wouldn't be helpful at all. So, uh, but, well, in that case, what can we say? We still feel that there is some difference. So, how do authors do? Well, often, as in the quote by Valeria that I quoted at the start, uh, she doesn't write just. Uh, resemblance versus arbitrariness says something about the direct or natural resemblance. Okay, so this is a typical way to uh, reintroduce something more subtle in this criterion. And the question is, can we make this idea more precise? What would it mean? So this is when I examine the first proposal, whose main uh, proponent in recent years has been the psychologist and philosopher Keith uh, Stenning, um, about directness or indirectness of resemblance. Um, bearing in mind that actually this criterion has to be between representations that are structured, that have a lot of structure, and that are not arbitrary. So, what does this mean? Okay. So, I guess if we look at a representation like a representation like this and compare it to the map. Uh, here, I have an x. I don't really know what the x in isolation stands for. This x stands in a certain spatial relation with the p, for instance, or with the symbol of negation, but it doesn't really allow me to uh, go to a corresponding relation in a certain domain of objects. I only have symbols and certain spatial relations between them, but to interpret these spatial relations, which are uh, in this case, in one dimension and uh, can be derived from concatenation, let's say. Uh, if I want to pass from these spatial relations to some semantic plane, I have to go through the... That's not true because I couldn't... I, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I actually only talked for uh, 20 minutes. So, uh... <laughs> I'm sorry, the official watch is mine. <laughs> okay, I'll be fast. I'll be fast. Um, so yes, so um, so I made this briefer. So this idea is that uh, uh, you have to go through a complex syntax to interpret the spatial relations. Whereas here, there's a clear, let's say, 
uh, homogeneous interpretation of the spatial relations. The, the, the relation between two signs always has kind of a uniform interpretation in a domain of objects. So it's kind of clear. So here's a quote by Stanning, which, where he tries to... Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I didn't want uh, the ISPR to be. Um, an abstract syntax is defined in a single spatial relation, concatenation. In written language, concatenation defines the scanning sequence, left to right and top to bottom. In spoken language, concatenation is a temporal relation. The interpretation is indirect because the significance of two elements being spatially or temporally concatenated cannot be assessed without knowing what abstract syntactic relation holds between them. So written text is interpreted spatially. Different spatial arrangements of words have different meanings. Okay, so uh, uh, ARB is not the same as BRA but not directly, in the sense that particular spatial arrangements such as immediate contiguity do not have uniform meanings. So the, the meaning is not uniform and you need to go through a syntax to understand what the meaning is. So that's the first proposal that is often made. Uh, okay, now we'll go to a second criteria, uh, which has been mostly uh, defended by uh, Atsushi Shimojima, uh, and the idea is as follows. I think I managed to be to be a fan. So now the idea is that maybe when you use a graphical representation, you some you use something like uh, constraints of the space you are using it to get some info uh, to um, you are writing the representation in to get some information. Uh, to make this more precise, I do as Atsushi Shimojima does himself. And um, also, uh, yes, yeah, so he wrote a whole paper on the linguistic graphic distinction, which is based actually on his PhD thesis, where he reviews uh, various other uh, criteria that have been proposed, and he criticizes some of them, and then other he includes in his own criterion, which I'm going to expose now. I uh, just wanted to give you some idea of what his... Uh, methodology there was, and just also to show you that actually many other criteria than those I've been talking about have been proposed um, from very naive ones, like uh, the idea that you have a sequence in language and not a sequence in the graphic case, uh, that in language the relation symbols always have to, have to be explicit, whereas in the graphic case maybe uh, you can dispense with relation symbols and use space to carry the relations. Um, and many of those he refutes quite convincingly. And others he tries to explain using his own criterion, which is criterion G, uh, systems that project dynamic constraints or not. So I'm going to explain this uh, terminology now. So let's start with uh, a toy example. Um, which he gives. It's the idea that if you represent, for instance, the order of arrival of people in a race. So you can use a certain convention that you will write them sequentially from left to right. So name A appears to the left of name B if A finished the race before B. So for instance, Marco finishes first. Of course, of course you will to finish first. That was uh, very important to, uh, to, to, to placate you uh, before the question. So. Um, so uh, Marco arrives first, and then Louise, and then Michel, maybe, and so this means that Marco finished first, followed by Louise and Michel. So what's interesting about this is that you see the following phenomenon. If I tell you that Marco finished before Eloise, and that Eloise finished before Michel, and you decide to represent that, okay, maybe you don't know everything, so you don't know if there are people in between, but you, you write it down like this, if you write these two informations using such a system of representation, you're forced to represent as well the further information that Marco arrived before Michel using the, uh, the interpretation rule that name A appears to the left of name B if A finished the race before B. So if I represent this information, Marco before Eloise and Eloise before Michel, I automatically represent the further information that Marco arrived before Michel. Yes? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. 
I probably just wrote that again. Yes. I cannot represent the informations that Marco finished before Luis and that Luis finished before Michel without at the same time representing that Marco finished before Michel. Uh, Shimojima calls this a free write. What he means by that is that you would have to do an inference if you only have the linguistic sentences. Uh, you have to do an inference to pass from the two informations that I gave you to the conclusion that Marco finished before Michel. You would have to do an inference. Whereas um, in this representation, you can read the information in the same way that you would read the information that I initially gave you. They are all equal in there. Okay. Um, this is why he calls this a free run. Uh, and actually, this, this um, let's say, this property is also linked to others, for instance, there are some information that you cannot represent without presupposing some further information. For instance, if I just say that Marco finished before Eloise and that Marco finished before Michel, you can't represent these informations because you don't know what the relation between Eloise and Michel are. So you don't know whether you should write this or that. So the, the fact that you have constraints also forces you to decide some things potentially, depending on what the initial information is. So, okay. So his idea is that a representation should be called graphic or spatial, potentially, if it exploits such constraints, such nomic constraints, which in this case are clearly geometric ones, or topological ones, something like that. Um, is this interesting in mathematics? Well, Okay, I'll just uh, give an, a quick example and i finish. Um, so, this could be debated, but for instance, if I give you some inequalities, okay, um, the distance between A and 10 is 5, the distance between B and 10 is 3, um, and I ask you to give me what the maximal value of B minus A could be, this, the, different, the distance actually between B and A, uh, you could represent it graphically, and potentially such a phenomenon will happen too. So uh, I gave a slightly more complicated example than just the order because I thought that would be a bit silly. But uh, some constraints on the representations allow you to see some further information on the uh, representation. And actually, you can see that the maximal value here uh, must be uh, 6, 7, 8. Because you can have it here and here, here and here. Okay. And potentially, this could be true of some other kinds of representations as well, and uh, just submit this for my last slide. You know, you could have something like this. I know Marco was expecting this, so I didn't want to disappoint him. But uh, potentially, you could say that the fact that they will intersect to a certain extent could be understood in this setting as well. But uh, okay. So uh, just a word of conclusion, perhaps. Uh, we didn't want to give any. Uh, any uh, straightforward answer to what such a distinction should be or whether there should be whether there is any kind of strict boundary between the two but what we see here is that we have at least two criteria that may be contested and that maybe David is not, does not agree with all of that so we can discuss um, but both of them are interesting, and it's not clear that they would give the same results, or maybe they're just describing two different features that representations may or may not have. Uh, they may not always go together. You may have, let's say, representations that choose a lot of syntax, but maybe you also have some spatial constraints that can help you. Maybe if you write trees or formulas for derivations, things like that. Um, and uh, actually, there's a lot of literature that exploits these borderline cases and that tries to put some doubt uh, on the distinction, to give some doubts about the discussion by the distinction by introducing many intermediate cases. We try to give another approach to identify, let's say, some more fundamental problems. But uh, at this point, it's probably good to fall back again on these borderline cases and start to wonder whether maybe the in independent criteria that um, so I think I'll stop there. Mm -hmm.